Well, like I said, welcome. Uh, welcome to our webinar on immune suppressed or compromised and what is important to know uh, with and Dr. Alejandro Gru. Let's get started. So welcome, thanks for attending. The uh, participating foundation staff is myself, I'm Holly. I'm the Chief Operating and Financial Officer and Autumn Lentz, uh, who is our Education Manager. We will be doing a poll uh, to better get to know you. I'm gonna launch that here in just a second. Uh, just so you're aware, we will be accepting Q&A. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you are on a desktop or a laptop, please feel free at any time to enter your questions there and the doctor will address them during Q&A time. So please feel free to add them. Yes, this is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, and come to you in a direct email link after the show. We want to thank all of our individual and fun, individual donors and funding partners for making programs like this webinar possible. Uh, we cannot do it without you. We count on your funding to ensure uh, that we are able to, to bring these programs to you. And our most heartfelt thank you to Dr. Alejandro Gru, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Pathology, Dermapath, Pathology Section and Fellowship Program Director at the University of Virginia School of Me Medicine. Uh, his specialty is dermapathology and pathology. Dr. Gru is an active member of several professional associations and has published many peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Gru is board, cert board certified in pathology and a highly accomplished clinician and researcher with a focus in cutaneous lymphoma. Dr. Gru is also a very valued member of the Foundation's Research Advisory Council, as well as our Scientific Review Committee. He participated in the development of our research roadmap and also sat on the committee outlining our catalyst, current Catalyst Research Grant. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gru to tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Gru, for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so, so much, Holly, Autumn. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and in this uh, special occasion. And um, let me start sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. <clears throat> so it's it's a real pleasure and an honor. So I, I just wanted to um, introduce myself. So I'm a pathologist and my role in, um, in the diagnosis and management of cutaneous lymphomas is somewhat dif different. And, uh, and oftentimes uh, we as pathologists don't have the opportunity uh, and the pleasure to interact with the patients directly. So we are the people uh, that are often uh, sitting uh, under, uh, sitting to the, uh, next to the microscope and essentially uh, the ones who are reviewing the um, biopsies that are done for patients who have cutaneous lymphomas. Uh, and, um, and we play a key role uh, particularly because, as you all know, uh, the diagnosis of cutaneous lymphomas can be very difficult and challenging, and sometimes it takes uh, a significant amount of time to, to reach out and to, to get it, the, the diagnosis, uh, be, because sometimes the findings can be very subtle. But it's really an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you. And um, uh, so Holly has, uh, and uh, uh, they, they've asked me with a difficult task about trying to talk about um, uh, what do we see as physicians uh, in terms of what are the challenges related to uh, immunosuppression in terms of what is immunosuppression? What, when, does that, when does that happen in association with cutaneous lymphomas? 
um, and uh, how can we make it somewhat better? How, how can we um, provide some ways that the patients can handle these scenarios better and can be aware of what the risks are? And uh, so um, these are my conflicts of interest. And, and Holly has mentioned that a lot of these companies who have uh, provided me uh, ask uh, with to, to participate as consultant and uh, as an investigator played a critical role in in the um, uh, in the development of programs uh, like this. So anyway, uh, I wanted to um, to provide you know some background information. As you all know, there are many many cutaneous lymphomas. Uh, cutaneous lymphomas are rare in general, um, and um, most of the cutaneous lymphomas we see in the most of the lymphomas we see in the skin are typically derived from the T cells. And, and as you know, T cells and B cells play a critical role. They're lymphocytes, and they play a critical role in the defense against external organisms. And they also play a role in the generation of autoimmune conditions, for example, where there is an exaggerated immunologic reaction from our system that drives into diseases that could that that are related to the the excessive uh, uh, responses from these lymphocytes. Um, and, and because the T cells in the skin are much more common than the B cells as normal resident cells, that's why we often see more patients that have cutaneous T cell lymphomas than we see with compared to cutaneous B cell lymphomas. And here you can see this list that is based on the WHO classification. The WHO classification is the uh, sort of the most methodical and comprehensive way we use as clinicians, either pathologists or hematologists or dermatologists to classify these conditions. And we always rely on an approach that is derived from what things we see on a clinical basis, what type of skin lesions we find in our patients who suffer from this, and also what pathologic findings, what do we see under the microscope and what markers these abnormal cells have in the skin that translate into a combination of clinical and pathologic findings that allow us to determine a specific diagnosis. And as you know, uh, we're trying to tailor therapies to a very specific disease and the advances in molecular biology are leading us to understand what are the genomics, what are the background that, that this unusual uh, conditions have so we can treat them better. So you can see here is a long list of cutaneous T cell lymphomas. And um, the most common ones we see in practice are mycosis fungoides and accessory syndrome. And, and you can see other conditions here, like for example, a lymphomatoid papillosis or cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which tend to be very limited skin or self-limited skin uh, uh, tumors that we can often treat with, localize, with localized forms of treatment. But we also need to be aware that there are other more, more happily, less common, more aggressive subtypes of lymphomas that really require immediate care, immediate attention, and try to be many times more aggressive in the way we treat them, because we know that if we don't, the, the, the consequences can be serious and sometimes fatal. And the B-cell lymphomas are less common, as you can see, and most of them are also indolent conditions, like for example, 
the so-called primary cutaneous follicle center lymphoma and marginal cell lymphoma, where we see just isolated skin lesions and most patients usually do not have or do not do never progress to having the disease outside from the skin. So these are lesions that oftentimes it can be treated locally and, uh, and many times the patients can be completely cured. As opposed to, for example, the most common cutaneous lymphoma we see with MF where could definitive cure is at this, at this stage in our life still difficult to achieve. Another thing I mentioned is that really as pathologists and as part of the integrated diagnostic team, we need to understand what patients have on the skin, how the lesions look like, because we know that uh, we can find specific things under the microscope that could be shared by different conditions. In other words, you can see the exact same findings under a microscope, but depending on what the clinical representation is, the diagnosis might be very different. And the prognosis can also be very different. So I just wanted to do a little summary. You know, mycosis fungoides is, is one of, is the most common form of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And this picture that I'm showing to you is from the early 19th century. So mycosis fungoides is actually one of the first lymphoma subtypes ever described in the history. And um, this picture shows someone who had what we now recognize as a specific subtype of mycosis fungoides, where patients present a lot of times with skin tumors or lesions in the head and neck, in, in the face, for example, in areas where there's a lot of hair. As you know, the incidence is low overall. So we really, as clinicians, have to get together because nobody, we, we don't see enough of them. They are, they are rare. And we need to put all the brains together to have a larger number of patients and try to come up with recommendations that work for uh, things that are not common. Uh, similar to other lymphomas, the, the, the age of presentation tends to happen around the age of 60 and it peaks around the age of 80. We don't see, for example, very frequently mycosis fungoides in children, but sometimes we do see them. And uh, we really don't know what causes, uh, what is the cause of MF. But the one thing that I think is critical to remember, and this is gonna be one of the things that I will mention about, is that there is a dysregulation of the immune system. And that dysregulation of the immune system is important because we understand that when the disease sometimes progresses with time and becomes more advanced or the lesions are uh, become tumors, uh, we tend to see a higher prevalence of an abnormal response of our own immune system. In other words, the patients are more predisposed to develop infections. And we really have to take care of those infections because we know that sometimes those, those could lead to uh, significant issues, uh, especially for someone, for example, for patients that have accessory syndrome, which is a form of mycosis fibroides where the, the disease circulates in the blood. So we know, for example, the location of where the lesions happen usually happen in areas that are not exposed to the sun. And I'm sure you all know and are aware that when you're out in the sun, a lot of times those, that's the way we treat the disease, right? And, and, and that's how we can get the disease better. And it's one of the most efficacious forms to treat people who have mycosis fungoides. And we know that certain variants of mycosis fungoides have uh, predilection for certain sites. I mentioned before this folliculotropic variant of the disease that happens in areas where there's a lot of hair in our skin. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the clinical staging, as you all know, is critical because 
the decision-making process in the treatment is based on the staging of the disease. The stage is not defined, but, but what we see under the microscope, but what do we see directly on the patients? How much disease there is on the skin? How much of the body, of the surface of the body is affected? What type of lesions you have? What is, is it a flat lesion? Is it a thick lesion? Do you have a tumor? And, and so forth. We also are aware of an increased annual incidence of the disease. I'm not sure there is a true incidence uh, that has increased or actually we recognize the disease more easily and more frequently. Whereas before with more limited technologies or with more limited knowledge of the disease, we might have had a harder time. Um, and um, so factors that are predictive of uh, disease progression are also important. So I mentioned the amount of disease in the body that is involved, the involvement of other sites. So for example, once the disease goes outside the skin, for example, from a lymph node, on a lymph node, we know that um, that is indicative of progression. But we also do know that many times people could have swollen nodes because you have a lot of rash in the skin and the lymph nodes react against the rash, kind of like increasing in size and getting populated with lymphocytes that are gonna defend ourselves from, from those. Um, I don't wanna show many pictures, but I, I just want you to see, you know, different examples of hypo or hyperpigmented lesions. So these are darker lesions and these are paler lesions on someone who has MF, they're very common. Many times the skin becomes very thin. A lot of times people, you might have heard that the, the skin almost has the texture of a cigarette paper like because it's very atrophic. And, uh, and it also when the disease progresses, many times we see a lot of redness, generalized reddening of the skin that is often referred to as erythroderma. So, and as mentioned before, many times we have complications that are derived from infections, especially in patients that have uh, accessory syndrome or mycosis fungoides that has developed, that has now, that is now present in the blood. How do we see that? How is that we think that the immune system changes? What we do know is there are certain responses that our T lymphocytes do. Um, there are T helper responses. T helper cells are cells that are critical in our immune, immunologic reactions against infections, against tumors, et cetera. And one of the things we've learned is that when the disease progresses, for example, when it goes from patches or plaques and then to develop tumors or the development of the disease in the blood, we notice that there is a significant increased susceptibility to infection. And that is, we believe that there is an impaired mechanism of our host T cells to actually create an appropriate immunologic response to defend ourselves from, from those, from bacteria, from viruses, uh, et cetera. You can see here, this is um, the, national, uh, uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines to, for the treatment of patients with cutaneous T cell lymphomas. I just wanted to point out that when you look at people who have early stage disease or patients that have few lesions clinically or thin lesions, and they don't require any type of uh, treatment that is systemic, these are often medications that are usually safe and do not create a significant issue in our host immunologic response. In other words, you know, this, in, this medications we typically use like topical corticosteroids, retinoids like vexerotine, phototherapy or localized radiation or iniquimod, in general, they are very safe 
and should not make us worried about the possibility of you know being being more prone to develop infections uh, in opposition many times as we see patients that have progressed in their disease uh, remember that most patients with MF will not progress during the course of disease. Most patients will typically stay in this in the side, in limited patch plaque disease or generalized patch plaque disease, and will not require systemic therapy. That's that's what most people do. But those who do, who do have progression, who have development of swollen nodes that are involved by the lymphoma or when we see involvement of the peripheral blood, we do require to treat patients with other medications that might have consequences for the immune system. So especially those, more especially those that we really need to treat them aggressively because our goal is to really eradicate the disease because if we don't, the consequences can be very serious. So I wanted to bring out this publication we presented early last year because I think it's very relevant. And this is a publication that was, uh, that came out in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, which is one of the most prestigious dermatology journals. And because of the pandemic, and because of the seriousness of the pandemic and the seriousness of putting someone exposed to a higher degree of immunosuppression with certain therapies, we wanted to provide some guidelines for the clinicians to understand what medications in general are considered safe, are considered non-disruptive of our immune system, and which ones are actually should be really uh, restricted to those patients who are really require a more aggressive treatment. And we essentially divide the different diseases into kind of four major uh, categories. We have the low risk, and these are patients that have early stage mycosis fungoides, or they have, for example, lymphomatoid papillosis, or they have an indolent cutaneous lymphoma. We do know, or a B-cell lymphoma that is indolent. These are conditions that could be handled very safely with skin-directed therapeutic approaches. Even sometimes excising the lesion with a, with a small excision, or sometimes applying a low dose of radiation. Those are things that are not gonna put the patient at risk or being more, uh, being more susceptible to infections. Then we have an intermediate risk, which are patients who perhaps have more extensive disease, but is still low risk. Uh, so for example, patients that have mycosis fungoides of stage 1b or stage 2a, which includes patients that have reactive lymph nodes. And then, of course, we had those individuals who really we have to treat them. Uh, despite the fact that we understand that many times we are exposing patients to some degree of immune suppression from the system because we have to do that in order to treat the disease itself. So therapies that are considered low risk, for example, topical retinoids, and I, I'm sure you are, many of you are familiar with this type of uh, therapies, so uh, mechloridamine gel, uh, topical steroids, imiquimod, home narrowband UVB phototherapy. At that time, we had some concerns about patients who were getting phototherapy outside your home because of the risk of traveling, which with COVID-19 were quite significant, especially if you had to make numerous uh, numerous trips per week or per month. So the consensus was that all low-risk therapies, these are safe. They are not making the patient predisposed to 
in, to infections. They're not suppressive of the immune system and are suitable and should be continued for all patients. Um, the risk of travel and exposure likely outweighed the benefit of an in-office treatment such as UV light or total body electron beam radiation, especially for, early, for low risk patients. And of course, we can still use home-based home narrowband UBB phototherapy uh, or other forms of treatment. So this is, this is what the recommendation have. Then we have the intermediate risk. These are agents that sometimes could make, uh, create some side effects that include, for example, uh, reducing your total number of white blood cells and can perhaps put you at a slightly higher risk for developing infections. Methotrexate, bexerotine, uh, vorinostab, interferons, those who are considered intermediate risk patients risk, where there is a slightly higher risk of infection, but in general, they're safe. So these are patients who typically have more advanced disease. Um, uh, we try to limit the amount of laboratory monitoring because of the COVID pandemic and the risk of traveling and getting uh, blood drawn each time. Um, and the initiation of these therapies, we recommended that may be postponed using low risk bridge therapies in the short term if there was a high, an individual high risk. Now, all these recommendations now, of course, you can, you know, are different because the vaccine has become available. And I do hope that you're all aware that one of my first and most important recommendations is to get vaccinated for COVID-19 and for flu, because those are things that are gonna keep you safe. And we do know that with the level of evidence that exists are gonna reduce the risk of having complications from either coronavirus or uh, the flu. Finally, we have high risk therapies. And these of course are, are medications that are more likely to not that could create issues with your immune system and can predispose you on and put you on a higher risk for developing infection. Prolotrexate, ramidepsin, mogamolizumab, rentuximab, gemcitabine, and of course, you know, if we do, uh, um, uh, and other things from, from traveling exposure. I wanted to also point out that as we have learned more and more about the disease, we know that the use of biologics and targeted therapies have really created a major change in the way we treat patients with cutaneous lymphomas. And we know we're treating them better uh, because we can see significant more responses. So this is the data from the Lancet, a study that looked at uh, the use of brentuximab vidotin and showed that patients that had advanced stage mycosis fungoides really did much better than those patients who were taking other medications as physician uh, for, uh, for the treatment of choice. This is an example of the clinical response we see when patients uh, get brentuximab who have advanced disease. And we're also very encouraged by the fact that we're seeing all those new monoclonal antibodies and these immune modulators that are used to treat other cancer conditions and how useful they could be to modulate the immune system and, and, and perhaps leads to a much better uh, and uh, less toxic response uh, in, in the diseases that we're studying. So just looking back a couple of years ago when the so-called PD-1 inhibitors came out and it was really a very interesting data that showed how we can help our own immune system to overactivate it and get rid of the cancerous cells. And that was really led to really a Nobel Prize, as you all know, in the for the development of these medications to treat patients with, with, with cancer. But we also know some pitfalls that came out. And I'm sure you all have seen in the news how a promising uh, medicine for cancer actually made the things worse. And this were patients that have 
a subtype of cutaneous lymphoma that is very uncommon that we see more in patients from certain areas of the world, for example, Japan or the Caribbean area where this virus is endemic. And this virus is called HTLV1, which is a virus that is similar to the HIV virus and makes the patients uh, uh, very predisposed to developing infections. And we actually learned that this disease, which is actually very aggressive, when we gave this medication to some of these patients, it actually made the things worse. And it made us, it gave us a good step point to think, well, maybe not all patients will benefit from this. And actually some of them, the condition can get worse from it. I just wanna to touch briefly over some of the medications. So extracorporeal photophoresis, these are, uh, this is used for patients that typically have um, cancerous cells in the blood with very excellent uh, response rates. And actually what we think is that the use of extracorporeal photophoresis tends to reduce the risk of infections, especially in patients that have uh, accessory syndrome. Total skin electron beam therapy. This is also a very effective way to use radiation, external radiation uh, uh, in, in the body. Interestingly, while it does have significant side effects, Infections are not one of the major ones when we use uh, this treatment modality. More frequently, as you all know, in uh, patients that have mycofungoides or, or accessory syndrome. Interferon is another uh, medication that you all are probably aware and have been perhaps exposed to. Myelosuppression is usually minimal. In, in the US, we typically use a variant of interferon called interferon alpha. And the myelosuppression, which is very mild, typically happens in a very small number of patients. And usually we get transient leukopenia. Um, and you can see, for example, in the study where uh, interferon was given to 108 patients for more than five years, and to 56 or more than 10 years without any evidence of late toxicity. And only a small number of patients had developed a slight level of neutropenia and there were no rates reported of infection. So interferon is a very safe medication to be used in general. Uh, so overall, again, it's considered a non-immune suppressive regimen. And then we have others that are, uh, have a slight a higher risk, methotrexate, prolotrexate, uh, methotrexate has much less risk, and parlotrexate does have a substantial risk of mucositis, thrombocytopenia. And the rate of infections, for example, when we talked about methotrexate in some series can range to up to 58% of cases. These are usually localized infections. I'm not talking about systemic generalized infections where patients need to be in the hospital and et cetera. I don't want you to be to be afraid of this. The metotrexate is a medication that's been there for a long time that we know very well and is safe for most patients at the doses uh, that we routinely use. Brintoximab vedotin, this is a conjugated monoclonal antibody that is uh, ligated to a cytotoxic agent. And what we're trying to accomplish is attack and kill those cells that have CD30 expression. And um, this is very useful in many patients that have mycosis fungoides. But one of the problems we have with brentuximab is the high rates of uh, peripheral neuropathy that uh, patients experience. And the problem is not necessarily a direct infection, but the problem is that if you cannot feel because your nerves are damaged, you are at higher risk of an infection that could progress. And that is the problem that sometimes we see. Um, the new data, and this is what came out from the final uh, Alcanza study, is that 82% of patients that use brentuximab usually have improvement uh, of the neuropathy or resolution and complete and complete resolution, uh, despite being on the treatment for that. And the skin infection was only present in 3% of cases. And this is based on the Alcanza study which is the study that led to the approval of the medication 
uh, in the US to treat patients with mycosis fungoides. Alantuzumab is now used less often. And while this is a medication that unfortunately has a substantial risk of infection, specifically because it makes the patient's lymphocyte count decrease and it creates a, a marked lymphopenia that makes the patients predisposed to developing infections, which sometimes can be serious from cyto cytomegalovirus. But the, the, the counterpart of that is that it's actually a very effective medication getting rid of cancerous cells in the peripheral blood. So um, despite being used less often, it's actually a very useful uh, tool to treat uh, many patients. Um, uh, HIDAC inhibitors, so histone deacetylase inhibitors, often uh, medications that typically do not have a significant higher risk for infection themselves, but they do have a higher risk, for example, for things like thrombocytopenia. Mogamolizumab, which as you all know, is the, uh, one of the most recent medications that has been uh, uh, used to treat the disease MF. Um, uh, rashes are a problem. Uh, uh, as you know, people experience this cutaneous manifestations from the medication itself, and actually 21% of patients develop some infections. And the problem is because we're targeting the, some of the T helper cells that help you against infections, uh, we also target the neoplastic cells too. So the, the, the effect of depleting CD4 positive T cells creates a higher risk for uh, getting infections and, and, and so forth. And also immune checkpoint inhibitors, which I mentioned. So pembrolizumab uh, is one. And these are medications we actually tend to see not evidence of infection, but actually overactivation of the immune system and sometimes autoimmune conditions that are secondary to that happen or are exacerbated uh, in patients who are receiving these blockers. It's also, we also know, for example, that some lymphomas are really linked to some autoimmune states where they are, our immune system overreacts and it makes us more prone to developing this subtype of lymphomas. One of them is the so-called paniculitis-like T-cell lymphoma. Actually, about 25% of patients that have this lymphoma subtype usually carry a, an autoimmune condition, typically lupus erythematosus, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, or Sjogren's syndrome. And actually the way we treat most of these patients is immunosuppressing. We have to reduce this overactivation of the immune system to be able to treat it uh, more effectively. And we learned that this overactivation of the system sometimes is related to specific mutations that could lead to the development of aggressive states uh, in these conditions. Um, so uh, some, auto, some, some uh, immunodeficiency states, so some patients, for example, that have genetic disorders that make them prone to immune deficiency, we also can see some lymphoma subtypes. These are a small series of patients that have combined variable immunodeficiency, IgA deficiency, and they unfortunately develop uh, some uh, lymphoma subtypes uh, due to that. And lastly, of course, I wanna remind you that many times a state of immune suppression or a state of a weakened immune system can make the, uh, the, the can, can create a, a background or a baseline that makes our, our body more susceptible to developing viral related cancers. And this happens, for example, with the Epstein-Barr virus, which happens in association with a variety of B-cell lymphomas, as well as T and NK-cell lymphomas. And with that, that's, uh, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And, and I'm, I, I'm looking forward very much to uh, trying to uh, help answer some of the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer. That was incredible and a wealth of information. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time to go so uh, in depth and provide so much valuable information. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Autumn uh, to, to, to facilitate some questions.
Thank you very much. So uh, the first question that we have is, how can individuals with MF support ongoing research without being part of a clinical trial of a new drug? Um, so the, the question is, um, how can uh, patients help uh, to support research uh, that is not related to clinical trials or it's independent from pharmaceutical related uh, things? That's an excellent question. And I, as you know, uh, so I am uh, part of the Research Advisory Council for uh, the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. And one of our most important funding mechanisms is the so-called Catalyst Grant. And we have other young investigator grants that allow young investigators and even more senior investigators to develop, to, to essentially propose uh, research studies that are many times completely independent of any type of uh, pharmaceutical related trial. Most of them are. And we are really dependent on the contributions from our members, but also from our patients who make our foundation. So your help is critical for everything we do on our daily basis. And it's critical to be able to think about it this way. We are studying a very rare and uncommon disease and, and it's hard to, it's, it's, uh, many times the funding mechanisms are hard to compete when we looked at or when we study rare diseases as opposed to much more common ones. But we still need to study because that's the only way we're gonna find uh, a cure or our, we're gonna find a ways to, to tackle them. So we are, we are all devoted to you and your contributions and collaborations to, to, to keep this uh, type of funding mechanisms uh, going. Okay, and, and thank you. Holly, there if you is... wanna add something to that, I, please do because you, you are, you know, uh, your role is critical in this, so. I think you absolutely said it wonderfully. Thank you. So there was a second part to this question, and I'm not really sure if it's something we can answer, but I wanted to ask it is, in addition to supporting the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, can one donate skin images or skin biopsies? Um, well, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult question. It's a great one. Um, we learn a lot. We are devoted to the care of you and your skin conditions. And the more we see of you and the more we see in terms of understanding how your disease look under different circumstances, it's critical for us to learn uh, of the, about the disease and, and how to care about it. Um, uh, so, I, I'm not aware of any specific mechanism at this point to do that. The other problem is, um, as you know, is that most of the time when there is a research angle, um, we, we have to have a protocol in place. And the once you know, a biopsy is taken, really the, the tissue, while well, it's your tissue because the biopsy is taken from a part of your skin, it, it the, it falls under all the regulations, the, the regulatory domains that come from the hospital, the practice, or the pathology lab. And that has a lot of higher complexity things than just saying, hey, I want to donate this to study it more. Uh, we really depend on many times uh, taking, and, and this is very true for any research studies you are involved when there is tissue taken, that you need to understand that this is many times the only way we're gonna find, we are gonna understand better what's going on with the disease. So while it is true, sometimes we have to take a little more tissue, we do it many times because we need to understand a little bit more um, about it. But I'm, I, I'm not sure I was able to, to answer that well, sorry about it. I think you made a valiant effort. It was a difficult one. Thank you. 
The next question we have is, if I have MS stage one, am I considered immunocompromised or immunosuppressed when considering COVID? Uh, that's a good question. And the answer is no. So if you have early stage MF, uh, a stage one, and you have a low amount of disease in your body, you have no, you have the same risk for uh, getting exposed to COVID that any normal person will have who is immune competent. So being having MF does, but at an early stage does not make you more prone to having a more com severe complication from coronavirus if you get infected from COVID. Okay, thank you. The next is again about COVID. Are there any issues for MS patients with getting the COVID-19 booster shots, i.e. is it preferable to receive the same type as the original that was received or can you mix and match? Uh, I don't think that I, up to my, to the level of my knowledge, I don't think this has been studied. So there is no really good scientific answer to that. What I will say is any vaccine is a great vaccine. So getting either the same one you had before, uh, you know, if you had Moderna, get Moderna. If you had Pfizer, get Pfizer. But mix and match, I think it's perfectly fine. And, and the data seems to show that in any people who are mix and match, they, they, get, a strong, they get a strong booster and, and that's appropriate. I just want to remind people, those who are, who have more advanced stage disease, who perhaps are getting exposed to a medication that make you more prone to infections like methotrexate, want to make sure you've already seek out for getting the third shot, the booster. Uh, that's very critical and very important. Thank you. Next question, are there tests to see if immune spreading medications we take are causing immunosuppression? Well, um, so, so some of the medications that you take, um, we, we use for some of the medications you take, uh, many times there are surrogate markers we use too. So for example, we know that patients who are uh, getting some of the systemic, the systemic agents can have a drop in their white blood cell count. So we wanted to make sure that you're getting, C, uh, that you're getting uh, CBCs on, uh, on a basis that your physician determines to be adequate. So because we know that once your white blood cells count drop, you are more prone to develop infections, especially if your neutrophils go down, we know those are, yeah, or for example, if you are receiving systemic chemotherapy because you have a more aggressive form of lymphoma in the skin, we wanted to make sure that those get followed closely. And if you need a booster of someone, of something that is gonna help you raise the white blood cell count, that those are things that are useful. Um, but it's not just one laboratory assay that will determine uh, one thing or another. It depends on really the medication you're taking. It depends on the frequency, it depends on the route. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a perfect answer. It really depends. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next question, is there anything I can do to help improve my immune system if it is compromised and or suppressed? If, if it's compromised or suppressed? Well, that's, that's a great question. So I think that, um, you know, so the routine things that you do to make your organism stronger, like exercising as much as you can. Um, uh, so making sure that if you're out or if you are in a place where it's crowded with many people that you wear masks. Uh, it, uh, make sure that you hygienize your skin specifically. We know, for example, patients that have Cesare syndrome, they often have, you know, significant, their, their, their immune system in the skin, it makes them more susceptible to skin infections. You want to make sure 
that you are careful and watchful for any developing signs of skin infection uh, and you maintain appropriate hygiene and care of the skin. Um, and uh, so, and, and, and ultimately, if you are on a state that makes you significantly suppressed, you know, perhaps that's, and, and I know we are all tired of quarantine and long periods of quarantine, I think, you know, you have to be careful and uh, watchful of, you know, of trying to avoid uh, places where you'd be with a lot of people, you know, you're trying to minimize your risk of getting exposed to other people who can be sick or something, so. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Guru. At this time, we don't have any other questions in the queue. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes. So if anyone wants to hurry up and get their question typed in, we can ask it. If not, we will turn it over to Holly so she can do a wrap up. Thank you so much. Um, I, I Again, I can't thank uh, Dr. Groove enough for being with us. Um, I'm going to do a uh, final uh, screen share here uh, just to let folks know, um, again, we, we ask because we care. I know that I have said this before. You've probably heard me say it in emails, text messages, and every other communication. We do circulate surveys, but we do use that data for improving the foundation's programs and services and making sure we're meeting your needs. So we hope that um, you will take a few minutes to fill that out. Um, we want to let you know that if you haven't joined the mailing list and you want to, please do that. Uh, visit the website. It is a wealth of information. Uh, there is a ton of resources and valuable education information there. This video will live on our website as well as on our YouTube channel uh, for you to view later and, and reference should you, should you need or want to. Um, if you're looking for a peer-to-peer -peer support area, join our community connections. It's a great opportunity to exchange and, and um, uh, exchange ideas and share with others who are uh, dealing with the same things you are. Follow us on social media, uh, social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube to hear what's coming up and what's going on. And again, with that, I want to again thank Dr. Gru for his time this evening and Autumn for joining me and all of you for spending an hour of your time with us. And I hope that you feel that you have learned something new about uh, immunocompromised and immunosuppressed. And we'll wish you a good evening. <laughs>